we are recorded we are live streaming everything is as it should thank you technology hello everybody my name is christine reiner i am the communications coordinator for the specialty producers association um and today we have our featured guest charles dowling all the way from the uk who will be talking about no dig market gardening and sharing a bunch of beneficial tips on how you can save money and grow healthier bigger fruits and vegetables um charles welcome thank you very much christina how's um how's your day been um busy as usual but very busy good as usual. right and so uh for our viewers who may not know charles is he's pretty famous honestly he's authored 15 books um the 15th is coming out here in a few months and i'll let him talk about that but he's also um, known worldwide thanks to his YouTube channel and social medias where he shares no dig information education and tips with viewers just like you so we are extremely excited to have you speak with us today um, and we're excited to learn about your methods and who you are but um, can you just describe how you got into the no dig sphere and a little bit about your background for us right yeah so basically I started market gardening in 1982 and was right into it from the very beginning, but a bit lost in the detail because not many other market gardeners uh, were doing it. And so at first, for example, I was inspired by reading Ruth Stout. I don't know if any of you have heard of her. She's in Connecticut. And she'd written a book called No Work Gardening, came out in the 60s, and she marched with hay. And I copied that and bought a load of hay And because I was worried about weeds. You know, that, that's what I'd seen so much of with organic market gardening in the 80s. Everybody was submerged with weeds. So I thought, right, I'll mulch. And I, sure enough, I controlled the weeds, but I also harvested not so much because in our climate here, I'm in southern UK, we have a temperate maritime climate. It's often damp, not very sunny, more like the PNW, Pacific Northwest. And when I planted my little plants, they were eaten by slugs. So I thought, hang on a minute. <laughs> and that was the hay mulch uh, harboring them. So uh, over the years, I've refined my technique to work in a damp climate, particularly with compost mulch. So my mulch, words, words can be confusing and, and some people say, well, you're not mulching then. But for me, compost is the mulch. On the beds, I put on about an inch a year. And on my pathways, I put on a bit less than that in thickness of half rotted wood chip. So all the soil is covered all year round with some mulch. <laughs> but if you look at the beds, they, they look like bare soil, but it's not bare because it's just got compost on top. And that way, what I found is works brilliantly for soil fertility because it's working in harmony with natural processes where uh, leaf litter and organic matter always lands on the surface and then is taken in by soil microorganisms and you're not damaging them by doing any tilling. So you're leaving them to do the work, which basically they want to do and they don't expect things to do. And so, you know, working in alliance with nature like that, not only do you save time, but you get a better result. Um, I'm running two trial beds here, dig alongside with no dig. And just very briefly, in 11 years, the no dig bed for the same amount of compost added. So the additions are the same. Everything's the same. Plantings are the same. But the output, the yield over 11 years is 12 percent higher on no dig and I've just had the carbon content of the soil analyzed that's like organic matter and in the bed I dig every year it's 14 percent which is actually really high but that's because I'm putting on a decent amount of compost which is what you need to grow vegetables but on the no dig bed it's not 14 it's 18 percent in other words four percent carbon in the soil from doing less work and from applying the same amount of carbon and you know for me that's like wow I was really amazed to see that result which is confirmation basically of what I've noticed. You know, it's an effective method. Uh, it gives you less weeds. So you, it's time saving. It's a massive time saver. So I look forward to sharing this with you and, and answering your questions. Right. And of course, the, the biggest question to any garden is how do I get rid of these weeds <laughs> and make sure that the rest of what I'm growing stays safe? So um, you kind of led the charge on the no dig you know let's let's kind of talk back about maybe what that timeline looks like when you started sharing this information of hey maybe this process could be better so when we think about traditional gardening and how it requires you to till the soil and break down the particles why is it better to do no dig in your garden 
Yeah, well, certainly when I started sharing my experience, I, I got shut it down a lot because it was not considered um, normal. <laughs> and it's certainly people were saying, asking this question exactly, well, how can this possibly work? You know, we've been tilling, digging for all our lives and it works as far as they could see anyway. And uh, with, with no dig, what I've had to work hard to prove is, because, uh, you know, I've been really against the mainstream for a long time. It's only just tipping a bit now. But you get better drainage. You get better moisture retention. It, it, it literally ticks every box. And I, and I can see that in my garden. Like, um, you know, your question here, it says literally traditional gardening requires you to break down the soil into small pieces. Well, what, what I've seen from my dignity trial, where you do that, um, the growth is not so good. And I think it's because when you break the soil into small pieces, you, you are actually destroying a lot of organisms that are working to glue it together. You know, I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard of aggregation of soil and uh, structure. You know, those two things are better in no dig because what you've got is microorganisms like the mycelia, the mycorrhizal fungi, which helps us to feed and find moisture in return for carbon from the atmosphere. So a mutual exchange going on all the time. And those microorganisms, as the mycelia, as they thread their way through the soil and build up a network, it's like a network of roots. And so a plant root getting in contact with that invisible network, these are tiny threads of mycelia you can't see with an naked eye or very rarely. And they, as they grow, they exude or um, give off some glues in the soil called glomalin. I mean, I can get as technical as you want here, but I, I don't want to make it sound too complicated, but the, you know, I've, I've been doing more and more research into why it works so well. And it's just useful to know, I think, you know, this glomalin is like a glue. If you're leaving soil around, uh, alone, it's also carbon. So you're, you're building this up and that helps all particles to bind together. So you, basically you don't want your soil to be shattered into millions of fragments. What you want is it to be open, but in a structure like little um, little balls, I don't know quite how to describe it, but like the size of a pinhead maybe, that, that through which water can drain and which holds air in the soil. So you're ticking both of those boxes. Again, by doing not much, but just leaving it alone. <laughs> but feeding organic matter on the surface, that's what the compost is doing. The compost is not fertilizer. It's um, organic matter with microbes, which is feeding the microbial life. And thinking of soil like that as a living organism is, is where you want to be going with this. Um, it's very enlightening because then you realize that what you need to do every year actually is apply a little bit of compost on top. You're feeding the soil life. And you don't need to think, hey, I'm going to grow potatoes. I need to put on a load of compost because it's lots of nitrogen, NPK or whatever, that kind of thing. You're just not thinking like that. You're thinking in terms of feeding the soil life because they, those organisms can then make the fertilizer, if you like, which is already in the soil, nutrients available to plants. So it's actually, a, it's a much easier method. Uh, just quickly, I'll mention here, I don't actually do a four-year rotation, just so you know, uh, because I found that you don't need to when your soil is really healthy and fertile. Um, it can cope with pretty much anything. And I'm just doing a trial here of growing potatoes in the same bed where it's year 10 now. So that, well, this is the 10th year of growing potatoes in that same soil. And all I can say is they're super healthy at the moment. They're looking really good. I think we're going to get another a 10th really good harvest from that ground. So just to you know reassure you, it works so well. Just the water retention, the runoff and the erosion is kind of the biggest thing, but... Um... Potatoes are pretty incredible. I I threw them in a cardboard box, and I it's the best thing I've grown so far this summer. <laughs> um, right. so it's really really great to know for ten years straight. Um, kind of talking uh, about your compost process. Can you tell us if somebody is traditionally taking doing till digs, how would you suggest that they transition into your process or into a no dig garden? Well, I. I would I would say that the results of my trial show how tilling, uh, digging any kind of soil disturbance depletes soil carbon. So you're looking to build it up again. Uh, depends how much you've been tilling and whether you've been applying organic matter, which which could, by the way, you know, compost can be well rotted manure. It can be uh, old wood chip even. It can be anything decomposed. So you you don't need to set the the, the bar too tight on that. Uh, it opens up possibilities to get lots of sources of organic matter for your soil. That's what you need, and that's what the soil needs. And that's the transition. Is uh, if, if most most growers, I'd say, well, hopefully you, you you're on top of the weeds enough that you you can start with a clean surface. In which case, some people use cardboard when they start 
no dig and that's to smother the weeds but you maybe don't have many weeds and if so or you could just hoe lightly um you know especially in summer like this because you can start any time of year uh just hoe lightly so that all the weeds die in the sun and then you put maybe two inches i would recommend three if you can find that much on your beds which personally i recommend to be four foot wide i find that width works really well i know that's a bit wider than many growers use uh, and my pathways are 16 inches. Uh, those measurements over many decades, basically, of you know, what I've come to as, as something that works. Because there's, there's another understanding here, which is that with no dig, no till soil, you can walk on your beds. You can. It's not like the soil is so soft that you mustn't ever walk on it. Because people say that when they're tilling, which I totally understand, because they have basically they've destroyed the structure. So it's all loose. And if you try and that, you squash it. But with no dig, like I was mentioning, the, those soil uh, glues that are in there from the microorganisms, they're holding the soil together. So the soil is always springy. It's you, like I can walk on my beds. It's like walking on a sort of trampoline or a sponge. And you, and you can see your footprint go down a bit and then you look behind you and it's come up again. So, you know, little things like that are very reassuring. And, and the carrots go down and all of that kind of thing. So, yeah, that, that's your starting point. Use a bit more compost at the beginning to get the fertility high. I'm talking particularly about growing vegetables because they are very demanding plants, it's not in terms so much of nutrients, but of soil fertility generally, moisture retention, that kind of thing. Because that's a big one, I reckon, for you guys probably. You're drier than here. And this method is fantastic for moisture retention. Um, I've heard really good reports from people in Utah. I was just talking to someone in Arizona this morning on YouTube, for example, you know, and, and it's working for them, even with a compost mulch, which looks dry on the surface but it's holding moisture below so sometimes you know we can't see it but it's working for us and we need to just leave it alone <laughs> but... yeah well on that note I quickly can i quickly say one one thing which is um I, I don't worry about soil tests you know i know there might be a place for them I'm, I'm, I'm not, but in a general way i think probably people over worry about that mm -hmm. and what i use for my soil tests is my plants you know where you can see as long as they're healthy you don't really need to worry about the fine fine details and it's about that whole thing or two of moving away from fertilizers there might well be certain things you need like calcium fair enough you know uh, uh but probably people around you will also know about that it, it's more a sort of general regional thing often uh but yeah really go for the organic matter and building up soil life so say i've i've decided to take on the new challenge of a no soil garden can I do that outside of a raised bed or do I need to be in a raised bed? Does it need to kind of have a containment or um, is it whatever uh, yeah. works best for me? I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I, I think a lot of people assume that you need raised beds and you actually don't. And I find it works better more on the level. And that's partly moisture retention, actually. Uh, you know, you haven't got sides that are losing evaporation moisture. Uh, you're saving money if you're not. Uh, th this maybe doesn't apply so much to market growers, but certainly for for, for people with yards, you know, just for home home use, um, you, you know, don't buy the wood for the make those boxes kind of thing. Just keep it slightly raised beds. And what happens then is that you haven't got any wood in the way and plants in your beds can root into the pathways. And this links to another really important understanding that I think often gets forgotten is that the soil in your pathways that you're walking on regularly is actually good stuff and needs looking after and then it, it, it's available it's open enough that roots of say your vegetables or flowers this works brilliantly for flowers if you're any of you are flower growers that you they will be able to root into that soil because there's nothing in the way and so basically you're expanding your cropping area uh, and saving money so yeah definitely worthwhile <laughs> right yeah just if if you're very type A and you like your straight lines, you know, that might drive you a little mad, but that's okay. Um, I, I'm very much chaos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it just, no, I mean, straight bed. lines are good. I've yeah. done, I'm, my beds, you know, they they look pretty regular, but yeah. it's just that they don't have wooden sides. <laughs> and, and the profile is more like the waves of a sea. Think of it like that, you know, slightly raised. Yeah. Um, Carlos, slightly do you mind if I if I share my screen to show some of your raised beds here from Google? Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. So um I'm a very visual person, so I just I really like to see the photos, but he is um 
it's it's incredible um I actually think you're you're probably on my dream garden mood board somewhere. <laughs> um but so yeah, yeah. kind of talking about how um in here we can see that these aren't encapsulated with wood and so the soil is is allowed to just breathe and grow and, and do what it naturally does and you get to save on the cost of not having to supply wood uh sorry i couldn't tell uh, oh that's i see you got the interview with joe there joe lample that's <laughs> nice <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's a couple of beds in, in the, one of these photos which have raised uh, wooden sides, and that was my trial beds in the early days, and I've now taken them out. So some of these are quite historical, uh, but basically there's no beds in my garden anymore that have wooden sides or anything like that. Oh, really? And uh, yeah, it, it just makes everything so much simpler um, and more higher output. I mean, I'm selling in a year. I'm selling around. Thirty-two thousand pounds. That's maybe forty thousand dollars worth of produce from a third of an acre, and the high value comes partly from selling bags of mixed salad leaves. But the um, the issue there is is actually it's not as good as it might sound because when I started producing bags of mixed salad, that was in two thousand and three, twenty-one years ago, and I could sell a kilo to restaurants like that's two point two pounds for uh, 11 pounds maybe 14 dollars something like that and now the price is only 15 pounds maybe 20 dollars so it's hardly gone up in 21 years and you think how much other prices have gone up in that time it's mind-boggling and that's one thing that we're up against as producers is how to sell our food and make a living and it's totally not straightforward i'm sure many of you have noticed that and uh, so you just have to be ingenious and actually uh, i must say that in my case i supplement my production from the garden um income with other streams of income like from my writing and um, videos and everything like that social media is a very powerful tool we were talking about before um the call started started but it's a very powerful tool for gardeners business owners um you were telling me earlier you were connecting with several people from all over different parts of the world um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's what i love about it because um you know even in your state of dakota i'm sure there's people out there that you might not come across yet and you, you can contact them on social media and what a joy it is to always to find somebody who's doing something similar and you can swap notes and uh, yeah i've i found that social media has enabled me to also break the boundaries because previously with conventional legacy media you, you you have to go through an editor you know to get approved basically like an article or something um but with social media you can just put it out there see what the reaction is i right <laughs> the the instant reaction is is kind of what we now live for in our in our day and age but um you know when you use the platform to share the media and education and information that you have and then to know that you have even several more several more resources about your books here um and yeah. i have them pulled up in one of these apps so um if you if you are interested in charles books um you know they're all on either amazon or some other websites here and, and you can find them on your own but he he has lived this experience this is this is trial and error and an actual real person doing it you may be on the other side of the world but if our producers have questions and it looks like you may have one here um can i just mention christian that um yes. book i've got coming out compost because it, it relates to a question i've got here from your guys and it says what are different types of compost and where can someone usually find compost and that's a question i'm asked a lot with in relation to no dig uh, but it's it's actually you know anyone growing vegetables should be asking that question because it's not specifically no dig that needs compost it's just more visible because it's on top and i've talked about it a lot you know it's my fault a bit maybe that it's become synonymous uh, but it compost is like i said it's a very um general thing it's not it doesn't have to look perfect you can use lumpy compost especially when you're making beds that first application 
uh, it could be quite rough stuff, you know, six month old animal when you're around thing. If you get that down as your bottom layer or one year old leaf, leaf mold, I don't know if any of you make that kind of thing. Um, wood chip two years old, maybe, but sieved a bit. And then uh, keep just keep your finest compost the top layer, which gives you a nice surface to sow and plant into and, and you, you're up and running. But what you're doing is, you know, with compost or any kind of organic matter like this, is, is adding the capacity to hold moisture, the capacity to absorb moisture as it falls. So you'll be getting more value from the precious rainfall when it does happen. And you get a darker color on the surface. So that warms up the soil more readily in the spring. And it also holds warmth better in the winter because you, you've still got the capillary connection to the Earth's core, which is warmer than the mantle in the winter. And you've got better moisture retention through, again, through that capillary structure not being broken. There's just endless arguments. It, it feels like the more I look into it, you know, in, in favor of leaving soil alone, but it's just working using compost to create the surface into which you can sow and plant. And what you will find over time is that however awful seeming your soil might be at the beginning, like clay or whatever, whatever it is you have, even stony, rocky soil, you know, you build the compost on that, um, I've, done, I've had this comment from uh, Colorado and someone with not much soil, but they're saying they're amazed actually how, how things are growing with the compost on top. Not a huge amount, but maybe four inches, I would say minimum if your soil is very stony. And then you you will find that you plants can root down through through rocks and what have you. So it's, it's not always lost down there if you've got a rocky soil. And in fact, my first market garden was, was on a very stony soil. It was limestone brush. Uh, there were more stones than soil it felt like but having said that you know the and the carrots were not straight okay <laughs> but plants grew really well and again it comes back to the microbes partly that leaving the microbes in the soil means that you've got microbial breakdown of rocks and stones um, out of sight below your roots even but sometimes with the roots and then the roots can access those new nutrients as they're breaking down so yeah there's, there's lots of things going on that we never see <laughs> And which are working in our favor with no dig particularly. Well, and I like that you I like that you brought back that point because we did have a question from one of our um, audience members. Greg was asking about um, starting a new bed, presently previously overgrown with deep rooted grasses, and if he puts down a layer of cardboard and adds four inches of compost, he's wondering how long he should wait before planting so the roots can work past the cardboard. Should he plant a vegetable transplant directly into the compost mulch? Right. Yeah, good question. So um, what, one thing I'd recommend uh, if you're making beds at this time of year particularly is that you wet the cardboard before putting the compost on top. I don't often mention that part of it because often when it's making beds when it's damp, like in the winter, that's the most common time. But you absolutely can make no dig beds now. But like I say, wet the cardboard and that when you wet it and then you're applying hopefully damp compost, whatever that is on top, uh, that's going to keep it damp and it will decompose within about eight to ten weeks, probably eight weeks in summer heat. At which point your plant roots can travel down through into the soil below, uh, but also weeds, if they're perennial weeds, particularly uh, like convolvulus can come up through. So you've got to be prepared for that one as well. But in essence, what it means is if, if you got if you can get a good four inches, say, on top, you could make one of these beds uh, tomorrow morning and plant it up tomorrow afternoon. You know, you don't have to wait for the cardboard to decompose because you've got enough compost on top of it that plants can start their rooting process. They're not going to be making massive roots. Um, well, it's only for the first month. <laughs> but that, if you really want to crack on and get fantastic results, Go for six inches compost if you can manage it. But the principle is that the cardboard doesn't last forever and uh, that plants can root into the compost before they need to go down through it. Like individualized compost, right? Your cardboard would be a part of your compost anyway, but you're just layering it down on top. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, that actually relates to a question that, that Melissa raised at the beginning, which is, you know, what kind of compost and how suitable is it to plant into? It's a confusing subject potentially because what People say that if you put in search on Google, say, can I plant into compost? 90% of the answers say no. Uh, I would say yes, but the, with the caveat, the condition that the compost is reasonable quality. You know, that's it's these words. Words can be very misleading. You know, what do they actually mean? And there is a lot of compost out there that's good stuff, but it's not mature. And that's when it's hot 
So you get you get a truck turn up with drop you off a few tons of compost and it's all steaming hot. That you would not want to plant into. Uh, that would literally burn your roots. Uh, but if that same compost six months later would be great stuff, you know. So if if you're say thinking to make some beds this winter coming, I would order your compost now. If you're buying this kind of stuff, it's city compost. It's usually quite black. Uh, it's not the best, but it's not terrible either. Uh, but especially if you can let it mature and use it when it's calmed down a bit. Thank you. That's like you said, words are very, they can be very misleading. Um, and so, you know, asking that question and making sure like, okay, I've, I've put on compost, I've done all this, but not knowing, oh, this is a heavy manure compost that needed to sit for 90 days or something, you know, so save your yeah. transplants. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, manure is brilliant compost in the end, and it uh, depends what the bedding is. That's another thing. Manure is a word that's got so many meanings, animal manure, and uh, a lot of it depends on the bedding. And if you if the bedding that the animals have lain on is straw, that's one of the easiest to use because it breaks down quite quickly. But if it's wood, that will take longer, and maybe the manure isn't ready for 18 months in that case because you've got to allow some time for the wood flakes or whatever they are, chips, to break down a bit. Otherwise, they will be rubbing nitrogen from your roots because that material is in the ground, uh, in the rooting zone, which is different to when you're putting, say, a thin dose of wood chip on your pathways because that wood is above the soil. It's not rubbing the roots of nitrogen when it's just sitting on top of the of the soil ground, at ground level. I'm so glad you shared that. That's a very key point of knowledge and just understanding Yes, yeah, there there's so many things like that that you know but because these words get used um without full explanation i would say which, which i totally get you know people think assume that everyone knows what you're talking about but actually it's very good and if, if anyone's giving you advice um always ask them what they mean by some of this and also don't accept advice that doesn't make sense uh, because there's a lot of free advice out there and quite a bit of it is not true. <laughs> you know, I know from experience, I hear people come out with some real stunners. And uh, I just think, God, that's not right. And and yet other people are listening. They don't know. So they believe that. And then they go and make mistakes. You know, so you can really save yourself a lot of time and trouble by cluing up on, on, on information that's out there. It, it's got to make sense to you. You know, there's a really nice saying related to this, which is, it's not what you know. It's what you understand. And once you understand these processes, you know, which are quite simple, really, um, people will often, <laughs> often try and complicate them. Uh, like I said, no dig is just about minimal disturbance of the soil and feeding soil life with organic matter on the surface. That's it. Bye bye. You know, it's, you don't need to go massively deep into more understandings on that. There's just some details you need. Uh, and I'll just throw in one here, actually, that I really like personally, which is manure. So, well, what about the animal that we know best, maybe, um, which is ourselves? And what can you make or can you use human manure? And I know there's an American guy called Jenks who wrote a book with that title, Human Manure. Human manure. And um, I've just been doing one or two trials here myself because I've got a compost toilet in the garden. That's someone I'd recommend, something I'd recommend to anybody if you've got, if you want to do it, why not? You know, you, you've got a great resource there, uh, your own poo. And <laughs> basically, I, so we're filling it up in the garden and, and, and one tip is that you won't, have much it, it's amazing how little you get in the end but anyway we put a bit on a bed where we grew two squash plants last year and the yield doubled uh, so this year i've got it on a few potatoes just to see these are for home consumption by the way i'm not selling these um not that i'm worried but i just wouldn't sell them because people are quite you know a bit worried about it still um but, it comes but, and restrictions yes yes we we that, did have a, a webinar on food safety management so we <laughs> oh, yeah right <laughs> Similar, but you know, it's just having the ideas of doing that and and being able to to understand, like you said, uh, yeah. simple processes because we don't need to complicate it. You know, we are animals; we are human. We need to walk on our garden paths to also revitalize the soil and and bring in those nutrients too. So, um, I do, I don't want to look past this question, but we did have another question from Ruth, and I believe this is when we were talking about um layering the compost and the soil but she asked if um do you have any issues with small seeds emerging through the residue like lettuce ah so now hang on i'm not sure what that means uh, and through so, the 
I'm a little confused as well. So Ruth, could you share what you mean by residue here in the chat? And we'll try to get your question answered. I mean, well, I, this could lead to something actually, and I might be what she means that is uh, residue could be leaf litter, uh, what we call sometimes chop and drop, where you finish a harvest so and you leave the uh, remains, the leaves on the, on the soil. Uh, in 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 this climate here, particularly, uh, but generally, I'm removing everything to the compost heap. So we're making a lot of compost from residues, and none of it's on the ground because it, uh, in damp climates, that just harbors it gives home to slugs and snails, and they they would then eat the new planting or sowing. Uh, but I don't know how how prevalent slugs are in in your state in Dakota. Do you know? Well, we do have slugs. Um kind of again our state is it's like split in half <laughs> um so some out west river you know it might be a little more clay and then east river it's a lot more swampy so um ruth responded back to us and she goes the compost the other mulch so the small seeds do not have as much to push through say like peas yeah okay well yeah basically sowing into compost is the same as sowing into soil uh the you know, that's why I say get a get the finest compost as your top surface layer, whatever might be underneath a bit lumpy and that. And then you, you know, I just draw drills in, in my surface compost. Uh, I find seeds come out really well. I, I get, I don't get any germination issues. Like we just had a wet spring. So actually I have had some slug issues, not too bad. Um, but that's what I'm always concerned about. But you should find that with decent compost on the surface layer, that's at least the top inch, say, your seeds, everything you sow will come up, I would say, better than you've been used to when you sow into soil because you haven't got the issues of any capping. Uh, the, the moisture is retained better in the compost. The seeds can stay moist for longer until they germinate. And yeah, just try it. You'll be impressed, I'm sure. Well, Ruth, I hope that answered your question. And if it didn't, please. Um... Comment again in the chat, and if anybody else has questions during this, um, I don't want to take up too much of our time, but um, we do have a few other questions left. And so you've answered all of these kind of encapsulated. It, it seems like things are intertwined, you know. Um, if, if you need something, add some more compost, or if, if there's fungi or diseases happening to your leaves, maybe focus on your water. But um, how do you control weeds in a no dig if you're yeah. using compost and minerals that kind of boost their growth rate? Yeah. Um, okay, that's an interesting one because I kind of see the sense of it, but it definitely just isn't what happens, believe it or not. Because, um, yeah, one could go quite deep here, but basically the I think a soil is an organism. You know, the soil is the living skin of our planet. And when it's disturbed in any way through tilling, it's it's disrupted and it needs to heal. You know, I'm using language from uh, outside of soil, if you like, you know, healing soil, that kind of thing. Uh, but it's it's appropriate. I would say it definitely applies because what I notice is when soil is not disturbed, it doesn't need to heal. How does soil heal? It heals by growing weeds. Weeds are part of the recovery process. And that word is interesting because recovery in, the, in soil language, that literally is recover. And that's what the weeds are doing. They're reacting to disturbance, disruption by recovering soil. And so that's one reason when you don't till, you, you, if you haven't tried it, you'll be amazed. You just get fewer weeds. You obviously are going to get some. And that depends partly if you use animal manure as a, as a compost. There's often weed seeds in like from the hay that the horses maybe ate or whatever it is. And you've got to deal with that. So what two things. One is it's easier to remove weeds from a surface compost than it is from, say, clay soil. That's really striking. You know, once you start now, you'll realize that weeding is really easy, actually. You still got to do a bit, um, but it's pleasant. And then the other one is um, the, the hoeing the weeds. It's definitely, I'll do that sometimes. I'm sure you know the term weed strike when you catch them tiny. So, you know, I still use a hoe, but I'm just running it very lightly, almost effortlessly. Uh, through the surface compost and and that's something to bear in mind if you've got a compost that's full of weed seeds that's a really good way to control them catch them small I mean that's my golden rule is is weed small in fact there's the same we have in, in England which is um, hoe your weeds 
before you see them, <laughs> which of course doesn't really make sense. But the point of it is you're, you're catching them when they're just germinating. And so they've only got a root at that point. And if you look really closely, you can just see that first tiny little green shoot. That's when you want to tickle the surface with a hoe. And I say that deliberately, tickle the surface. You know, you're not going deep. You're not hacking into the soil. You're just disturbing enough to disturb those little rootlets. And then they, they die on a windy day or a bit of sunshine, that kind of thing. So, yeah, weeding, once you get the hang of it, it's not a big thing, but it's, it's little and often. That's, that's a really great tip to give someone. Yeah, as a gardener, we're always watching our sprouts. We're always seeing things pop up and we're like, is that a weed or is that something I want to put there? <laughs> um, good tip. But we did have another uh, question from one of our attendees. Ian is con currently converting to no dig and he plants a lot of baby greens in his with a jang cedar. His current compost is very fluffy and he's having trouble getting an even germination. Do you ever use a weighted bed roller before planting? And do you think it could maybe be a solution for an Ian? Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I don't basically. So I haven't got direct experience with that issue because I'm mostly using transplants. And I know, I've i noticed that a lot of uh, growers in the States more than here probably actually are direct seeding, which is fair enough. And I, in that case, obviously a lot depends on the quality of your surface compost and Maybe it is a bit dry and slightly lumpy. And yeah, use a roller. You know, that's not kind of contravening no dig or anything. It's, I would say that's really sensible that if, if that's going to give you that firm surface. Uh, and that, that leads to another really interesting observation about words, actually, because people often talk about compacted soil, at least they do in the UK. You know, I hear that word a lot. And that is not what you've got when you've got firm soil. But th those are two different things. You want soil to be firm. So using a roller on a surface compost bed is totally fine because you're, you're just firming the surface, uh, but that's not compacting it because you can't compact compost. Compost is, is just got its own innate structure uh, and it's light enough that it, it won't be squashed together and, you know, no air in there. So, yeah, good idea. Use a roller. Perfect. Yeah, that was a really great question. Um, so let's... Let's continue on to more fun questions um, about your no-dig market garden techniques. Um, so wouldn't water just run off in no-dig or, you know, just from traditional gardening to understanding that, how would you retain the water in the garden? Does the moisture and the soil just pull it? Or yeah. um, do you have to really guide your runoff? I get asked this a lot, and, and what, what I notice is, and I've, I've got so used to it, I kind of almost forget to mention it, that no-dig soil holds moisture incredibly well. And, like, for example, we had a, a dry summer here, or dry in our terms anyway, uh, in 2022, and I was watering quite a bit, but I don't have an irrigation system. I just have a hose, which somebody's holding, because I find that, in the end, is cheaper and more efficient than putting on a spray line or a drip lines. I don't use them either. I do have a spray line, two spray lines in my big tunnel. What big is 18 by 42 feet. Uh, but that's the only ones in the garden, nothing outside. And the reason is because I, I find I don't need much. And it, uh, certainly gardeners in the UK, a lot of people are overwatering. Um, you know, when you really get to know what you're doing, you could be amazed at how little water you need to give. Uh, so that's something to think about, especially with, with no dig, when you've got all that mycelial structure the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil and they can even help plants not only to find nutrients but to find moisture because those tiny little threads can enter and access soil particles with, with tiny spores or tiny um, holes which plant roots couldn't even get into so you've got options there for um well just basically you know getting more moisture sucking more moisture out of the soil and what, what, as a rule of thumb, what I do here is uh, say we're transplanting that we're doing at the moment, a lot of succession planting, like say um, beetroot after lettuce or whatever it might be. We'll, um, I make a hole by hand uh, with my dibber, I call it long handle dibber. Uh, so I'm doing this individually. It might seem a bit crazy, but I was planting a bed of lettuce last week and managed to dip about 400 holes in 40 minutes, something like that. Um, some people say that's a lot, <laughs> a lot of time, but actually, the point about it is when you do it by hand, you've got incredible precision and each hole is, is tailored to the depth of the surface. And then what it means is the subsequent planting is very quick. You literally, I'm using module trays, uh, small plug plants, 
and dropping them in the holes and just pushing them down. Uh, there's no filling in of holes or anything after that. And then we water in at that point, give a little bit of water either across the whole bed or even individually to the plants. Follow that up two days later, it hasn't rained with a bit more water again applied by hand and that's it until well, you know maybe six weeks because with no soil disturbance you've got a lot of residual moisture in the soil you can't see the surface looks dry and that encourages plants to get their roots down um you know if you had a totally arid um, july august whether you might need to order a bit more than that but I'm, I'm, what i'm <laughs> trying to convey is that a lot of the time you you can do less watering than than you maybe think as long as you get your plants established and then the second time that we water after that phase is when they're approaching harvest so like at the moment, we've got potatoes flowering here, for example. And yesterday I gave some water to some of them because we've actually had quite a dry June so far. And I gave water to some lettuce and new plants of cabbage. So that's just examples. Yeah, so this is for all those people who have older overwatering problems, helicopter plants, parents, step away. Very yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I, that, that dry summer I mentioned, we I added up my water bill because um, I'm actually just on domestic water rate. I'm uh, coming in. I'm not got any special farming rate. Um, paying so much a cubic meter, and it came to four hundred pounds worth of ex extra water I'd used that summer. And I thought, well, this is very reasonable actually. And I wrote to the water company and said, thank you, <laughs> because uh, it the cost of saying I don't have a borehole, and the cost of installing that, and then the solar panels needed to gen power a pump because that's all would all be off grid. It's pretty huge, actually. Uh, and so that links to another thing, which is about, you know, when you use this method, it, it's um, very suitable to growing on smaller spaces very intensively. And so you're concentrating your resources really efficiently. And my one third of an acre, you know, is producing that amount of food, uh, which could just about be a living for somebody if you keep your cost down, <laughs> your living expenses. Um, but, you know, that's only a third of an acre. So, um, I'm always advising people if they're starting out, you know, you might want a bit more than that, but basically be as small as you can. Bigger is not, you know, small is beautiful, bigger is not better. Do you, um, and this is not one of the questions we provided, but do you practice vertical growing sort of? Well. Um, capacity. <laughs> what, what do you mean by that exactly, please? Well, so like, um, you know, we utilize the space on the ground. Do you grow up at all, like trellising or stacking maybe on top of each other uh, just a tiny bit mainly under cover like in the spring for example i'm raising plants on benches and we'll be cropping some lettuce underneath that kind of thing because undercover space is so precious uh, and there's no wind because here it can be quite breezy and and that's my issue sometimes with growing plants vertically is they blow over <laughs> or they get damaged by the wind and uh, I'll do like beans on teepees, for example, rather than lines, so therefore the wind can blow through. Um, but actually not a huge amount because we 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 don't really need it. You know, we're getting such strong growth, more or less at ground level and also close planting. So every, every little bit of surface is being used already by, by plant leaves. You know, that, that's a really important thing with growing and um, not have unnecessary necessary space between. So that's why my pathways, for example, 16 inches, yeah, they actually pretty much get covered by leaves by the end of summer or even by the middle of summer. So you, you're threading your way through, but that's fine. Uh, but it means you've got more efficient use of the sunlight, but it's mostly at ground level. Wow. Are there are there really what are the common issues then for a no till market garden? Common issues. <laughs> uh, well, so like weed suppression is about easier, but like are you are you struggling with um, you know diseases or pests are you seeing oh, yeah okay yeah actually well that's two actually yeah well what pests is a huge one and like if i'm doing any kind of um general say q and a it's, it's nearly all about pests which <laughs> discourages me because it, it just feels a bit negative and you know shouldn't yeah. we be positive here and how you actually set things up and the, i would say that before talking about pests you know just when you get your soul really healthy generally you're not going to have no pests but what you're going to notice is that your plants are stronger and they can uh, tolerate some damage but you absolutely need to know you need to know before the pests arrive which ones are going to um, attack your plants and how to prevent that and here i'd say there's two two things i do one is using covers that's the main one 
uh, say we're anything we're planting at the moment we've got quite a few rabbits so we cover the small plants but we don't have too many rabbits we've also got some foxes that eat the rabbits and so on so it's just knowing those balance points and and i find that taking the covers off after a while often there's more than that the rabbits can eat <laughs> they might just have a nibble of some leaves and and it just saves having covers on everything all the time so that's my preferred way of doing it and rather than try and have a rabbit fence say around the whole property which can be quite hard to maintain I know quite a few people who have that and it's a big investment and everything. And then you get a rabbit get in and it can't get out. And, you know, you, you, it's really not nice. So it's targeting pests, you know, with some knowledge and, and making sure that effective measures are in place before the damage happens, because it's tragic. Yeah, it's a horrible feeling when you lose plants, even whole crops. We've got a new pest at the moment. I don't know if it's, it's in the States, but it's called Allium leaf minor. But I just put a video up about it on YouTube and Instagram uh, just to show people what it looks like. And so they can recognize the damage if it happens to them. It's arrived from Europe and it's been spreading slowly through the UK and it's just arrived here. And it, it does significant damage to onions and leeks, for example, two big crops. And so that that's really big news. And what we're all trying to work out how, how to stop this. We don't really know yet. Well, covers actually is probably the main method. But, you know, that's an example. So it's a really good question. Perhaps you've got to be on top of. And I'd just like to mention Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, I don't know if some of your listeners will know that one. Um, soil bacteria, <laughs> um, which you should be able to buy. And basically what it is, uh, as a, for organic growing, you spray it on leaves when there's butterflies laying eggs that would turn into caterpillars, we call them. I think you call them worms that are going to eat your leaves. And that uh, this... Um, soil bacteria on leaves it makes leaves indigestible to caterpillars you know that's one key bit of knowledge and useful product and you put it on about every 18 days and you you don't get plants eaten by worms so go for that one <laughs> noted write that down <laughs> dealing with the pest problems well thank you that was a kind of a an out of out of the ballpark question so that wasn't on my list um but i you know it's it's kind of the main thing like our producers uh, want to know about as well is I've invested so much, you know, how maybe yeah. is there an easier, more sustainable, environmental yeah. friendly way for me to kind of get rid of that. So thank you for answering that. Um, and again, I can't, you're just so interesting. We're running short on time, but um, one of my last questions is going to kind of be centered around maybe more of um, streamlining your market process. You know, you're growing on a pretty small um, yeah lot of land and so can you just roughly tell us how you found your markets and and give a few tips to our listeners about that okay well the two aspects to that is i learned the hard way uh when i started growing in 1983 and i had some beautiful radish and i managed to sell them to a local store and then my radish finished and the, <laughs> when i saw the guy he said well where's your succession you know you got to follow it and you can't just sort of supply me with radish and then suddenly not have any radish so yeah, that really sunk in. Uh, succession um, is a key point. And so with no dig, actually, it's a lot easier because what we call it no dig bed prep uh, is very quick. So you finish one planting, uh, we twist out the plant, say the lettuce or spinach or something like that, whatever, uh, they go on the compost heap, but you very quickly got your ground ready, a light raking over, that's all you need to do, get it level and you can sow or plant your next um, crop. And there's also, you don't need to apply more compost, by the way. That's the key bit of knowledge. Um, this works really well with one application of compost fertility in a year. So we, we do that in the winter when we've got more time. And then the beds are ready for spring. I'm not using cover crops, by the way. I haven't talked about that, actually. But because that's a bit of a sort of, I never say it's a bit fashionable at the moment. Um, it's not necessarily the best option because when you've got, some some cover crop you, you've, you've got to get rid of it you know how, how are you going to do that and how much time have you got to do that and it can be in the way when you actually want to sow and plant things the, the key top priority is to be growing food that you you can sell and uh, so be very careful with cover cropping i'm not saying it's a bad thing per se but just don't overdo it and make sure that you've got time and space to grow your actual crops um succession you can get better we do it with salad by careful picking rather than cutting so we do pick and come again, not cut and come again, like with lettuce taking out the leaves uh, on a weekly basis. And my lettuce can crop for 10 to 12 weeks from one sowing. So that reduces the amount of sowing and planting you have to do. So all those kinds of things 
are worth looking at in terms of how you keep your customers supplied all the time. So I'm selling salad, just for example, um, every week of the year, potentially. It depends in the winter that it can get too cold and the plants stop producing or slow down a lot. Um, but it's it's not too difficult once you get practiced at that. But finding a market is the big one. And that, that definitely links to the success, to the succession thing. Because if, if you've got produce all the time, um, you know that you can you can work on that and it's definitely achievable at least one 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 steady output that people really like and then you've got a customer you they know that you're going to be there for them and and then you can add other things when you're delivering say you or you can offer them you know this week i've got a few of this out and the other and it helps to sell everything you've got because if your market grow god that's so important um if, if you have too much stuff unsold well that's your profit really and uh well there's only so much you can eat <laughs> um I've recently um, struck up a great relationship with a local pub, which is like a mini restaurant. Uh, it's got quite a famous chef, Margot Henderson, who's involved, and, and she's got quite a high profile. So it's, it's been working well for both of us, actually. And not everyone maybe would have that kind of possibility, but if you find a chef you can work with, you know, if you're supplying restaurants, that kind of thing, you need an understanding with them. And they will hopefully come to appreciate that it's not always so simple as ringing up the wholesaler and saying, oh, I want this, that, and the other, you know, they actually do need to learn uh, uh, the positive side of working with what's truly in season. Um, and a lot of people talk about, you know, being seasonal without necessarily doing it. And uh, w when you really go down this road, you know, as a chef, I think it's more difficult because you, you've, you've got to adapt to what's there. And you might get unexpected um, vegetables different to the previous week, that sort of thing. And I've, I've built up, I would say I'm building up a nice relationship with, with the whole team of chefs in this place, actually. Three horseshoes in Backham, it is, if any of you are over in, in the UK. And, uh, you know, we, we've got an understanding. They know it's not always written in stone what they're going to get, but it should be fresh and seasonal and very flavorsome as well. Yeah, we definitely um, are very big supporters of creating markets between chefs and producers and getting them to schools. Um, so we do have uh, some chapters and, and people who do that work here for us. So we, we completely agree. It's, it's very important to, you know, it's it's a food chain system and there are many parts. Um, so including chefs or co-ops, wherever in your community, um, we love a good farmer's market. <laughs> but unfortunately, we, we have probably more months full of snow and cold than we do sunshine. So... Well, it's the same in, 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 in England, in the UK, because uh, actually markets here are very few and far between. I would say thriving, active farmers markets that in the whole country, a lot of them are in London, actually, because that's a big centre of population and people know they can sell it and they'll drive quite a long way to get there. And I I found over the years that I, I found in France for a while, actually, and I, a, a farmers market there was a much more thriving thing. They're, they're, it's more in their culture. And if, if, if you've got that, like you say, maybe not in Dakota, but in other states, it would be more. Uh, it's a lovely thing. But what what I really like with my selling, actually, is I've got a very good relationship with a, a spa, S-B-A-R, some sort of supermarket chain uh, in Bruton, our local town. And he sends me an order by email twice a week. And it's very regular. And and he knows I'll have it. And, and I know roughly what he's going to order. And and that means um, it's very quick. And so we can deliver. The delivery is all within an hour. We're not sort of hanging around a market. I'm not saying markets are bad, but, you know, you can spend half a day there and uh, also come back with a lot of stuff. So, yeah, there's many aspects to consider like that. Yeah, it's definitely producer's choice. And, and of course, you know, energy level, you have to, um, it takes a lot of planning for markets, like you said, succession planning and getting numbers right. And so to just make direct connections, that's, that's kind of the purpose of our organization to help. So um, I want to thank you so much, Charles, for your time and um, just closing remarks here, if there's any last bits you'd like to share. Um, but I, I do want to kind of promote your upcoming events too. So thank you. Yeah, well, uh, funny enough that my next big event is in USA, in Iowa, McMurray's Hatchery. <laughs> and they're having a Midwest Fest festival uh, with speakers and music, Rory Feek's going to be there, and, and a nice lineup of, of great stuff. And I'm doing the uh, the main speech actually on two days at midday, 
uh, on the 29th and the 30th of June. So if any of you fancy that, do check out. I think it's on the Murray's Factory website. And so that will be, I've been to California before, but I've never been to Central USA and I'm intrigued. <laughs> I'm curious it's what very I'm different. Yes, yeah, very different. Um, Hopefully you will enjoy it and hopefully our viewers, you know, can make time to see it. I know that. Um, <laughs> I'm going to check yeah. my schedule now and see if I can make a little road trip so maybe we could all get together. But um, that is very exciting, completely coincidental. We love to hear that. But thank you, Charles, for your time and your efforts and your knowledge. Um, if any of our producers want to go and follow Charles' social media, see his website, I've linked all of those in the chat. Um, and then for you watching after the live segment, we will have links for you to also get directed with Charles in that capacity, too. Um, but can I, I, can I say one more thing? Because I forgot to mention about the map on my website. So if you go to my website, which is just my name .co.uk, and there's a, a tab there. It says No Dig Global, and it's a map. And you can send us an email to apply to be on it with your details and maybe a photo if you want. Email, and we'll put you on the map. So, the, oh, thanks. Yeah, um, it's under free resources. And when you see that, then you'll see, um, God, am I right, actually? <laughs> no, maybe it's not there. Oh, yeah, so No Dig World Map. There you go, under Connect and Learn, just above No Dig for Kids. Third oh. column. Third column. See, there's oh, a lot yeah. of stuff okay. on this website. Yeah, there you go, No Dig World Map. And then uh, do do be in touch, because what what we're trying to do, that photo is me and Chile, we, we want to connect people all across the globe uh, who are, you know, doing this, these great things, growing food, no dig. Um, yeah, look at this. You know, it's just a massive amount of blobs now. Uh, I don't know what that one's doing in the Atlantic Ocean. I think that might be a mistake. <laughs> but basically, oh no, it could be, it could be an island, couldn't it? Uh, I hadn't looked at the map recently myself. There you got one in Ethiopia, for example. Uh, a couple in the Middle East and loads in the UK, but a lot in Europe. And that's this. A lot of people still don't know about this, so we're really working to. Um, to get this out and it'd be lovely to have some of you guys from dakota on there yeah if you go to the usa there you go. oh we don't have anybody from south dakota okay everybody like, hey this yourself. is our opportunity we'll literally put you on the map the international map so you know dig practices qualify for this so um you can sign up on his website that is a very cool feature right, great. look you're pretty you're very prominent here already <laughs> yeah sure yeah all right well um charles again thank you um to our viewers i want to thank you for taking the time and joining us today um, we appreciate your support and um without you this wouldn't be possible so the work that we do um is for you and thank you for showing up for us this segment has been funded under a conservation collaboration cooperative agreement um, between the Natural Resources Conservation Service and the South Dakota Specialty Producers Association. Our goal is to promote sustainable agricultural practices and environmental stewardship. The contents are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of the USDA or NRCS. Um, and again, I am Christine Reiner. And if you want to reach out, maybe you're interested in learning more or hosting a webinar yourself, please visit us on our website at sdspecialtyproducers.org and view all of our upcoming events. We've got endless webinars happening this summer. Um, so always check back frequently. And once this ends, our participants will be connected to a quick survey for feedback about um, this recording. So I want to thank you all and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you.